also would um, uh, voice, uh, let's say, what, what they know, what is actually going on, because there was so, and still is, such a polarized discussion and politicized discussion about migration and refugees in particular, that I think this is, an, and, and there are many people like me, I mean, I'm just one of the, f of the many who have the luxury to, well, to study migration and migration patterns and mechanisms. So I think it's very important that academics also do interfere when f uh, uh, based on their academic expertise. So you're the, uh, the academic insight for the, uh, for the debate. Well, uh, one of them, I don't know more. <laughs> but I would, uh, I, would be, I would welcome even more voices. Um, uh, and maybe also, let's say, that academics who are really specialized in these issues also could join forces more and, and, and also speak, not, not just as an individual academic, but also say, okay, this mm. is... Of course, there's a lot in, 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 let's say, in academia where you don't agree, and that's good. That's what academia is about. So we, we shouldn't all be um, uh, have the same... Um, uh, kind of, a, that's not, it's not about opinions, but about research results. So, so discussion is necessary, but there are also a number of things that we all agree upon. It's like the, the climate discussion. 98% uh, of the uh, uh, scholars know that, uh, uh, let's say, climate change is going on. Yeah. So, and I think those things, the basic things that we agree upon, should all also much be communicated much clearer to the larger public. Well, speaking of diverging opinions in academia, uh, there is one thing that we found out when we were looking at your research, uh, is that uh, the asylum seekers, the number and the volume of asylum seekers that Europe has received in the past three, four years, uh, it's not unprecedented in terms of the volume. In the Netherlands, for example, we were just having this conversation. This is uh, the number of immigrants that we're seeing right now is something that we have seen before. What we want to know is what are the factors that have contributed to the labeling of these events as a refugee crisis? Is it something that is warranted? Um, yeah, well, that's a very good question and also one that I pose myself. Um, uh, and I did a, an, an article in Ethic and Racial Studies also for myself to understand why, although in the 1990s, the number of asylum seekers in the Netherlands and also many other Western European countries were even higher than they were, let's say, from 2011 two onwards, why the debate has become much more apocalyptical than back then. So something apparently has changed, and it's not the numbers, it's not where people come from, because that, that's roughly the same. It's also not that, let's say, you could say, well, we still... We have a hands full still on those people from the 1990s because they don't integrate and it's so leave us alone for uh, the next uh, decade and then you can come back with new refugees. All these three, you, you can just show that that is not the case. So something else must be going on. And uh, my, um, my conclusion, but that's, well, that, that that's up for grabs, is that what, we s what really has changed um, is, I th are is the fact that populist parties have been very successful in linking a number of discussions that had been isolated from each other, were also there in the 1990s, but which had not been linked um, uh, back then. And then added with that, I think that 9-11 and terrorism uh, really played an, an important role in, um, well, in shifting people's perceptions um, and, and the whole fear, and understandably, I mean, I... And uh, don't get me wrong, but that's, that has really uh, made it in, into a very different ball game. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. But we still have uh, refugees uh, over the, there has been an uh, upswing to some extent uh, over the past years, uh, and we, we now have to integrate them. So that's uh, where we are right now. Uh, before we want to head into the concrete integration policies, I think it's a good idea to define what successful integration means for you. So Eva, <laughs> could you... Uh, yeah, that's um, it's a good question, probably a good one to start with, because if you ask 10 people what is integration and then even successful integration, you probably get 10 different answers, right? Because integration as a concept is a pretty fuzzy one, so it's not very clearly defined. And I guess you can look at it from different angles. There's maybe one part which has much more to do with personal identification, belonging, cultural identity, like where do you feel at home? Do you identify with the country where you live with? This is sort of one side which I, in my work, personally don't do that much. And at the OECD, we look much more at socioeconomic outcomes, which you could say is sort of another side of integration. So you look at how well do migrants generally, maybe refugees more specifically, 
do in the labor market and sort of like in the broader social life in a society, are they able to participate? So you can compare incomes, you can compare employment rates, you can look at how children of immigrants are doing in schools and compare that to a population that has never migrated and always was born in that country. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe a bit more of like a, you can call it objective way of looking at it because it's more easy to measure and more straightforward. But at the same time, defining what success is is really, really difficult because obviously yeah. it's an extremely diverse group. So if you have someone to take a bit of like a exaggerated example, right? Like an IT engineer who comes to the Netherlands, finds a good job and has a high salary, then yes, according to a lot of socioeconomic outcomes, this is a well-integrated migrant. But someone who comes to a Western European country has maybe a lot less formal schooling, maybe is not even fully literate in their own language, their sort of integration trajectory is going to look very different. It might take them longer to find a job. The job in the end might be sort of more like a low-skilled, lesser-paid kind of occupation. But does that mean that this person then is more or less successful? That's a very yeah. difficult question to answer yeah. and so is a political question in the end. So yeah. I think what helps in these sort of debates is looking a little bit more like what are actually the frameworks around this. So what do countries do? What do cities do to some extent? They've been very active as well in making sure that people can fully participate in social and economic life. And then you get into, I guess, a much broader discussion about equality of opportunity, um, participation, inclusion, which then also becomes much more of a narrowly defined integration topic because you talk then about a lot of different groups in societies that are traditionally disadvantaged or sort of excluded from accessing, for example, well-paying jobs and quality yeah. education. Uh, do you have uh, do you have a definition in, in mind? Well, I like s no, <laughs> but a very similar uh, take on it. I mean, yeah. I'm mostly, but ex that's v very much the same as what Eva was saying. On the one hand, you can look at uh, uh, identificational issues um, and then in that culture and identity and you can also ask the question and the social cultural planning bureau, well, that's not our official uh, English translation of the SAP, <laughs> but they've been looking, for example, at what are the opinions of people who came as refugees in the 1990s about gay marriage, about uh, women's rights, all these kind of issues you can measure, yeah? I mean, uh, so this, this, <coughs> this has to do with the identificational, which clearly now is very much on people's minds, eh? because many people think, well, the because the people come from Islamic countries, eh, they will not be able, even if they want to, eh? they're just so stuck in, into their, let's say, uh, a different kind of culture, so this, this will fail in the end. Um, well, this is not true, but uh, uh, so that's one. And the other thing is, is what Eva explained is the, the I would say, the structural issue. Mm. So that has to do with the labor market, but also housing market, are people segregated, yes or no, yeah. uh, education, yeah. um, and especially also of their children. Um, but I think it's also important if we talk about integration, because it's, um, uh, I always make an, uh, the distinction between um, integration as a program, which is a very political issue. I mean, that's what politicians say, they should integrate, and, and then they define what integration is. And I think you can study that also as a scholar, but I think what Eva and mm. I are much more interested in is integration as a process. Mm. So what is happening? Yeah, And, and mm. you, can, you can measure that. And, and finally, I think it's, it's important when it comes to integration as a process, this is also an interactive process. It's, it's not mm. only the migrants who have to do something or are doing something, mm -hmm. but also the society that they enter and, and join also changes. So that's also part of the integration process, uh, whether we like it or not. Yeah. Um, uh, we wanted to start with, with education as, um, as uh, a discussion topic. <coughs> uh, when, when looking at, uh, when doing our research, we, uh, we looked at Germany, uh, first mm -hmm. of all. And uh, two things caught our attention: uh, their welcome classes and their um, their tests for their civic integration test that tests uh, them on German German values and uh, linguistic ability. Mm -hmm. uh, Eva, could you uh, briefly uh, bring us through how a refugee is integrated into a, a school system in Germany? Right. So I think you mentioned two different things. So one of them are these sort of welcome classes, and that is really for children, so people who are still in the compulsory schooling age. Programs are a little bit different all over Germany because it's a federal system, so every little regional state sort of to some extent does their own thing. But in the end, the programs are always kind of similarly structured. 
um, where refugee kids, or generally migrant kids, anyone who arrives in Germany and uh, needs to go to school there, get additional support that usually starts with just learning the language. And then it depends massively on the age of the kids, of how quickly they are usually mainstreamed into regular education. And I guess that's sort of like a logical thing to do also as a policymaker. Then if, if a kid is five or six years old, they'll probably need less sort of academic German language skills to succeed in the school system. If you're 15, 16 and you arrive in Germany, then this is arguably a little bit more difficult because you have more time to sort of catch up um, to be on a similar academic level as German 15 or 16 year olds. So in most countries, they have developed these sort of introduction programs that are part of the school, one to two years, it depends a little bit on the age and where in Germany you are, and then the idea is to mainstream kids into regular schooling. But that is really for the children. And then you have a sort of different approach for adult migrants. Again, not only refugee specific, but generally all migrants who come to Germany um, usually have access to something that in Germany is called integration course. And that is really the sort of biggest program that is funded by the German government. For most migrant groups, it's for free. For many of them, including refugees, it's actually mandatory. And part of this integration course is also this civic part that you alluded to. Yeah. But actually, it's a minor part of it. So the main focus of that integration course is really language learning. Around, I'd say, like 80, 90 percent, I think you get like 600 to 700 hours of language tuition, which is actually quite a bit. Also, when you compare it to what is happening in other OECD countries, so it's a relatively extensive program. And then, as a small component of it, I think it's around 100 lessons or something like that, they give you an orientation course. Um, that has to do much with learning about how Germany as a country works, so it's information about the legal system, it's information about German history, to some extent also about values that we're supposed to uphold in like a Western European society. So they talk about the democratic, democratic system, free election, equality, these sort of issues. Yeah. And towards the end, you take a test. Um, when you look at how many people pass or fail that test, you'll see that for this civic integration orientation part, consistently more than 90% of people pass these tests. It's a multiple choice thing that you study for, you cross the right answers and then you're done. And the more interesting component I actually find of this integration course is the language part. And there you can see that only around half of the people who participate manage to get to a B1 level at the end. So like a sort of low intermediary um, language skill level in German. And another 40%, I think, reach A2. So I think the interesting discussion is there actually, how can we make sure that more people manage to get to a higher level in German in these courses, and how can we really develop like good pedagogical tools um, yeah. to enable people to learn the language. And for the civic integration part, I think also sort of more broadly in the discussion in Germany, this is actually not that much of an issue because the much more important thing when you think about specifically, again, labor market integration is that you learn German. And to what extent you identify or sort of like better understand ideas about democracy or equality, to what extent that happens with the test, it's very unclear. And to add to that maybe, specifically in Germany, they've done really interesting survey research with people who handed in their asylum applications, so at the um, German asylum offices, and they asked them all sorts of questions about their personal background, their educational background, but also these sort of like value questions, right? Like, what do you think yeah. about free elections? Do you think there should be free speech? Do you think both men and women should be allowed to work? And the share of people who say yes to all of these things is very high. And considering where they're coming from, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. If you're fleeing from a dictatorship or from a place that's been in conflict for years, from a war zone, mm -hmm then yes, the likelihood that you are very highly valuing things like free speech and fair and democratic elections is actually really high. So th this value, um, like, it isn't that big of a, an issue to have, uh, to make sure that I refugees have to teach the same values as in the Western <laughs> culture because they already have this. That's what you're implying. Well, it exists. Probably. It exists as part of that integration course because there is also a political interest in sort of talking about these things. Yeah. So it's definitely there. But I think there's 
and that's sort of my personal assessment, but also a kind of realization that there are certain things you can do as a state and certain programs you can provide. And um, then it might just make more sense to spend money on good language education and make sure that people are better equipped to become employable because that is actually the really difficult question. Mm. And then hope that along the way, because it's a long-term process, people get settled in Germany, people find a job, people make friends, they have German neighbors, that a lot of these things that people are worried about now people are just through our time as well and learn a little bit more about how German society functions. Maybe change their opinions, maybe not, but that's for a government, I think, much more difficult to steer than saying, okay, we put X amount in mon of money into this program and make sure that like 90% of refugees go through that language course and we make sure it's high quality and make sure we ha they have a certain language level at the end. We are going to be discussing this in detail, but before that, one question. Uh, the system of welcome classes, what struck me was that uh, you're going to put these refugee children uh, at whatever age in a different class, in a separate class for mm -hmm. the length of the course from the other German children, right? Do you think that, or like empirically, have there been negative consequences on social integration because of like this kind of uh, separation at such an early age? Uh, difficult to say. I think it also really depends on how a school level this is organized. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I wouldn't have come across any research that could really give you an answer to this, saying like there are negative effects of this doing that. But I think what is clear is that you should try to get kids as quickly as possible into mainstream education. Mm -hmm. And I think that is happening to some extent and for some age groups that's easier than for others, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but a lot of this, and sort of also through research that we've done in Germany and like school directors we met with and teachers, a lot really depends on the school people go to. So yeah. to what extent teachers are engaged, to what extent there is an open discussion, um, if maybe some classes are sort of linked earlier, like we came to, like we visited a school, for example, where there was a welcome class for 15 to 16 year olds and they really had sort of separate classes because their German wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. But then there were other aspects of the daily school life where the school made a very conscious effort of getting different student populations together and that could be physical education, that could be music training in the afternoon. They organized some form of like a, they called it buddy system of like mm. connecting a German born student to a new arrival, like help them to like get sort of find their way around yeah. in school. But that is something that is to say that broadly a little bit difficult because it really depends on more like the local level also. Uh, is, that is it better to have this this large approach this uh, from from the top or is it better to let schools uh, do this themselves and have more of a, a personal mm. approach based on based on the local situation i mean partly that's a question of legal frameworks also right in germany for example because it's a federal state it's essentially the federal state that designs most of their education policies so in a sense it already is relatively centralized but and it's, I mean, it's kind of a very classical governance question, right? But like ideally you'd have sort of quality standards and frameworks to make sure there's a sort of consistency across services, education, and sort of comparability also in terms of curriculum, but then give teachers and schools on the ground enough capacity and also enough funding, and that's a very important issue, to make sure they mm. can provide the services they might need on top for a student population that might need support, and that's not only refugees, right? That mm. massively also depends on just generally socioeconomic background. All right. Uh, we have time for an audience question now. Does anybody have a question? Um, sure. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Najib. Can you hear me? Not really. Is the mic working? It's not working. Is it working now? Yes. Perfect. I'm Najib. I'm a master's student in education policies for global development in Yuva. I'm a former refugee in Pakistan, and I'm originally from Afghanistan. I don't know how room for discussion choose uh, issues to talk about here. I think we should take more uh, proactive uh, approach rather than reactive approach for refugee crisis in the world. Uh, we should have had a discussion today why are refugees coming to Europe rather than integrating them because uh, the current recognition rate of Afghan refugees, for example, is around 30% in Europe. 
30, which means 70% of them are getting deported. But we are not talking about deportation of Afghan refugees here mm -hmm. because we are having a more reactive approach. So my question is uh, to both Eva and Leo. Uh, United Nations uh, High Council for Refugees, UNHCR, uh, sent a guideline recently about uh, Afghanistan and Afghan refugees for, for the whole world that Afghanistan is insecure and we should not send back Afghan refugees to an insecure country. That is United Nations, which every country in this world is member of. But what we are doing now, we are sending back refugees, deporting them to a country which is insecure against the United Nations guidelines. Are we United Nations or are we NU, not United? Okay. Uh, yeah, well. We want to keep it brief. For, first of all, this uh, is going to be short. Okay. Yeah. So, Leo, I want to ask the reasons behind refugee crisis in Europe. Reasons from a citizen uh, okay. based uh, mentality. Like, b why uh, have we attacked? Iraq, why have we attacked Afghanistan? Why have we attacked Syria? Did 9-11 happen in Afghanistan? By, uh, was planned in Afghanistan? No, Osama and uh, Mullah Omar and everybody was killed in Pakistan. Yeah. Did okay. Iraq yeah. produce mass destruction weapons? Okay. No, uh, nothing happened, but why okay. refugee crisis? Thank you. Okay, um, let's shall start with the last question. Um, uh, let's say what I would not call it a refugee crisis, by the way. If there is a refugee crisis, I would say it's a political crisis of the EU, who is not, not able in order to really devise a, a sound policy in order to deal with, let's say, uh, asylum seekers. But okay, that's one. But secondly, so if, if, if you then say why so many people came eh, in 2015, there's a, a real a spike eh, in 2015, 1 million, 1.2, 1, 1 which includes, by the way, also uh, uh, asylum seekers from Europe itself, especially the, mm. the Balkans. Um, well, if you look at where people come from, Syria is the main issue. Yeah? If you would take out all Syrian asylum seekers from the numbers, there would be no spike at all. It would be more or less business as usual if you look at the trends uh, from, let's say, 2010 onwards. So, um, so what really explains, let's say, um, uh, the, the rise of the numbers, the sudden rise in 2015, is Assad and Assad's regime. If, let's say, his father would still be there and it, it would still be a dictatorship, it would still be repressive, but he at least was not bombing part of his population. So, again, without the Syrian crisis, and that is a crisis for the Syrian civil war, um, we would maybe not have sit here. Yeah? Um, mm -hmm. So that would be my answer to your second question as to the first one um, and the relationship between the EU and HCR or the <laughs> happens oh. once in a while <laughs> okay what do we do flee <laughs> 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 okay um, as to the second uh, <laughs> <laughs> give us hope for a second <laughs> I hope this was not a comment to my question. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so the relationship between the U United Nations or the UNHCR, which is an agency of the UN, and what, what individual sovereign countries do uh, has always been, let's say, a very tense relationship. Mm -hmm. Because, let's say, um, nation states can decide for themselves whatever, um, let's say, uh, whatever the UN says, they can decide for themselves whether um, someone can, ca can be um, uh, granted asylum, yes or no. And there are countries which the, the, ap the, the, the rate is, the six, let's say, the acceptation rate for Afghans is 10%, and other it's 90%. So, mm. it, and that really depends on, on the country itself. And uh, so, d so the discussion about that should be also within these countries. Um, and, and this also, by the way, is a good reminder that we have all this discussion now about the migration com uh, compact of Marrakesh and all kind of politicians are now saying, well, we shouldn't do this because this, this will be in, uh, a breach of our so sovereignty and then uh, the UN will gonna decide whether we have, which is all nonsense. I mean, the to the it this is just a statement which is non-binding, which is, which is nice, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's it doesn't change anything about what nation states themselves can decide. No. Yeah, I mean, nothing much to add there really, just to say that, yeah, a lot of the discussion about especially the global compact 
doesn't really mention much that this is a sort of a declaration of intent and nothing that will bind countries to do something or the opposite of the side force them to do something. Yeah. All right. And you think then that the inter international community, given the state of international law, which is basically a bunch of agreements, can actually come together to do something for the refugee population? Because his point is valid. If asylum seekers are being sent back uh, to places that are clearly unsafe, but their applications have been rejected, I can't say what the statistics mm. on like those rejections are, yeah. then how do you provide like a better, safer society? Because the people who are living here as well feel threatened by what's happening, I guess. Yeah, well, if you look at, the pr uh, at what is happening now, I mean, this even goes much, f this goes beyond, let's say, um, that we m should be afraid of what international institutions are forcing us to do, because at this moment, um, EU member states and the EU as a whole is not uh, abiding and upholding international rules at all. I mean, yeah. we're sending back people to Libya, which is clearly not a safe country, where people are in slavery, where all kind of things happening that we that are not compatible with human rights at all. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, it wh which already shows, whatever you think of this, whether whatever your personal opinion as a citizen is, but it shows that the idea that if you s even sign uh, agreements, which is the Marrakesh not an agreement, it's mm. just a statement, but if even those countries who have signed all kinds of agreements about human rights, about refugee convention, they're clearly um, going against it now. And um, so, uh, that's, I think, the reality now, that the EU is more or less um, trying to, uh, to defunct the, um, the Geneva Convention. Yeah. And we also by ex externalizing the borders south of the Sahara, for example. So the whole policy is now devised in order to prevent that people can even reach the territory of, of the EU. Yeah. So they, they can't um, um, uh, apply for asylum. Uh, mm. So that, that's, that's the situation now. Yeah, but if we come back, back into the EU for a second, in the labor market, for example, there are a number of policies where, for example, the waiting time that is uh, used in the German labor market, when you've applied for asylum, you're supposed to wait for three months, I think, uh, before you get a job or you're allowed access to, a lab to the labor market. What what is the impact like of these policies on integration as well on the psyche of asylum seekers or on the state of these mm. families? Yeah, I guess it, it depends a little bit what country you look at mm -hmm. and also how quickly the asylum procedure is. I think that's a really <laughs> important part. But if you look at most OECD countries, which are most of the European countries as well, um, you see that most of them actually do have this waiting period. So you arrive in a country, you apply for asylum, and for a certain amount of months, you're not allowed to work. In most country that m countries, that ranges between like three to nine months, right? So in Germany, it's three. I think in the Netherlands, it's half a year. Um, in the UK, it's a year. So it depends a little bit on the context where you're in, how long asylum seekers are barred from the labor market. Um, then if asylum procedures are very short, it's not going to have much of like a practical impact, right? Because once you have refugee status and you're a recognized refugee, you have labor market access like everyone else. Mm -hmm. But of course, there are many incidences where the asylum procedures are long and where people are really barred from the labor market for a while. And if you look at the research, you can see, I mean, it's pretty obvious that the earlier you manage to access the labor market, the better it is for like your long-term sort of integration into jobs. It's also sort of an intuitive finding again, because like you said, like, yeah, there's a sort of psychological toll that comes with having to be idle, right? And having to sit around. Yeah. But then in practice, I'm not sure if we talk, for example, specifically about Germany now, if that is really the biggest issue. Because when you think about it, you arrive in a country, you hand in your asylum application, you're settled somewhere, three months is not that long of a time, right? Especially if you arrive in a country without speaking the language at all. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you could say, okay, what this impact really is, is maybe even negligible. Um, they had a sort of labor market testing in place in mm -hmm. Germany where um, as an employer, you sort of had to prove that there's no other qualified candidate for that um, position. But again, only for asylum seekers, right? Only for yeah. that specific group. That they have abolished. So there has been a bit of like a gradual liberalization of that system. But I think in practice, the much bigger job, uh, the much bigger problem is not 
that there are legal barriers for asylum seekers specifically, but that they're not in many cases employable enough, right? Because they don't have the language skills, they might not have the necessary training, they might have foreign diplomas that are not recognized in Germany. So I think these are the, practically mm, speaking, yeah. the much bigger hurdles than those first three months where you're not allowed to work. So how do uh, governments make these hurdles as, as small as possible? As how? Yeah. How, yeah. I mean, that's a political decision in saying like where it's where is three the biggest problem right now? Months, sorry? Where is the biggest problem right now and how they... Like you mean in what country? Mm. Uh, no, in, in what aspect of mm. labor market access? Yeah. Oh, you mean more practically yeah, in the sense yeah, that yeah. people yeah. face like like How is it addressed in policy, for example, a lack of qualifications right. or a lack of documentation? How right. would that so be again, solved? it depends a little bit on the group we're talking about, whether they have access to services or not. So if you're an asylum seeker, you might not be eligible for certain training programs that are offered by public employment services, right? But if we take the group of refugees, so people who've gone through the procedure, who have official refugee status, um, there are yeah, a couple of hurdles. We mentioned language, for example. So a lot of countries have been trying to, and Germany as well, to increase their capacity of language courses. And also, and that is something they have done in Germany for a while, but the number of participants was very small and they sort of rolled it out in 2016, 2017, to have courses that once you're done with the integration course, there are additional courses you can do to improve your language skills further. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even have like more of like professional vocabulary, vocational vocabulary. And the idea is, at least in theory, that that should already be combined with working because obviously to learn the language, you don't really do that in a classroom, right? That's yeah. a good basis, but to really become fluent, that is something you learn in daily communication, in your job, in contact with other people. Yeah. Um, and this idea of trying to combine sort of integration programs, but also trying to help people find a job at the same time, you see that in more and more countries happening, but it's kind of difficult to organize, obviously, because you also need employers that are flexible enough to say, okay, you can work part-time, okay, you can take a couple of days off here to do that specific language course, but yes, providing language courses, making sure people have access to training opportunities. Yeah. Um, investing more in procedures that can help people to get foreign diplomas recognized to make mm. sure people don't end up totally overqualified in jobs um, that are actually low skilled, although they have a university degree. These are sort of very practical policy and um, and responses. This is for refugees who are already have some amount of skills, right? But mm. there is a large percentage which is which qualifies as a low skilled, uh, uh, yeah, job seekers basically. Mm. So apart from language, how can we ensure that these people are able to access the labor market without putting like a downward pressure mm. on real wages? Because that is the perception right now, even if it's not empirically proven. And I mean, how is this something that we can uh, affect the perception or in policy, if it is true? Uh, for example, in the case of Netherlands, yeah. Yeah, I think that, that let's say the, there's a lot of research on to what extent uh, immigrants in general, uh, but also um, um, uh, refugees in, in more specifically, uh, whether they crowd out, let's say, the, uh, uh, the natives in the labor market or whether they have a downward effect on wages. And this was also the, the big discussion around the Brexit. Um, and all these, all these researches show at the macro level that this is not happening. And this is also not so strange because many of these uh, countries now have a very tight labor market, yeah. yeah? And mm. I mean, pff, the Netherlands, the yeah. Germany, they, it, it's the employers have the big, a big difficulty getting getting labor at all. Yeah. So, uh, but even if if that's more relaxed, you see that that they tend also to go to sectors where uh, where there is this demand for labor, which which for some reasons it's not there uh, um, uh, locally or on the national basis. So I think that's not the major problem there. I think, the, as, as Eva has explained, I think the, um, uh, the major issue for receiving societies is first of all really to look very good, also ask people. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, these are not objects to be shifted around yeah. and to, to be discussed. I mean, also ask them what they, what they know, what their skills are, what they would like to do. Um, and for many, this would mean that apart from language, I mean, that they would need, let's say, some ec extra training courses. And then uh, uh, you can see, an, in combination with employers, where they could build up their new lives. And it's interesting that Germany in the 1990s had a very successful policy 
not for asylum seekers, but for some three to four million Russians, whom they called Aussiedler. Mm. So these were immigrants who had some kind of, let's say, heritage to, to a German emigrant long ago, and, and on that basis, they got the German mm. nationality. Yeah, so they were citizens upon arrival. And for that group, a whole, let's say, uh, system was used in order to integrate them as soon as possible. So a lot of resources were put in that, and I think but maybe, Eva, you know mm. more about that, but my perception is that that worked quite well. Um, and that is some, so it's also choices mm. with how much effort mm. you want to, to put into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, there are a lot of, um, so y the negative effects are not that present, right, from refugees. But still we have in our politics quite a lot of uh, you see Brexit, it's mentioned a lot, and people do have this uh, tendency to, how do you call it, um, well, uh, feel with it, or at least uh, they drive with it. Uh, how uh, can, we, can we show the, the long-term benefits of, of having of integrating our um, migrants or in immigrants into our societies? To, like, how can we formulate this in political uh, debate? Well, um, let's say, we, and, and again, uh, scholarship is important here. We know more or less, and, and Eva's doing the work at the OECD. Uh, I mean, th it's not the, f the, f the fact that the problem is not that we don't know what the mechanisms mm. are, that we don't know how things work. The problem is to get this knowledge uh, into the public debate. And, and, and the big problem there is that there has been a real shift in politics in general in Western Europe to the right. So that also, let's say, um, what are middle parties uh, also to some extent have adopted the negative framing um, from well, what, what has been the extreme right. right? So that yeah. immigration and refugees are a problem uh, and that it has to be solved. And, and so it takes really courage now of politicians to go against this and, and to have a different framing and to use much more, let's say, uh, um, facts in, in this, but, but the problem is if people are against something and are, let's say, uh, used to this negative frame, facts in themselves or statistics, they don't help. Um, uh, because yeah. as well, say that it's yeah. being fabricated or, I mean, I have my direct in, uh, uh, yeah. experiences yeah. are different. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, but, but nevertheless, I think that the moral courage of politicians here so is really important, yeah. and in that sense, we're not in the most so positive uh, period of so European history, sorry. I'm afraid. Yeah. So why is there this discrepancy between personal experience or relatedness with this rhetoric and the data? What is this discrepancy? Do you want to say something, Marlene? Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is when you look at people's attitudes towards migrants more generally, they tend to be more negative when people have no interaction with migrants in their daily lives. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a really fascinating finding, actually, that mm -hmm. you see that people who don't interact with migrants on a day-to-day -day and live in areas where pretty much everyone is native-born, then there are more fears, there are more worries. So I think there is really something to be said about social interaction. Mm -hmm. and that will not always happen totally peacefully. Oh. Mm. But I guess if people manage to meet on a sort of level where they can maybe start seeing each other more as equals, and jobs are actually, can be a really good field for that, for people to meet and exchange, that is one way. I mean, maybe that is a little idealistic, and that's also something that yeah. is difficult for policy to describe, obviously. Yeah. But um, the fact that once people interact with migrants on a more regular basis than often there is a lot less stereotypes involved tells you something about how important it is to make sure that different groups of society come together and interact on a daily basis so government should focus on making policy that actually helps people interact with with refugees uh, like for example uh, we uh, we wanted to discuss this like ghettoization is a big problem as well right so is the is should the government try to create a space through social housing or some other yeah. platform where there's greater interaction so that this kind of thing doesn't happen? Yeah, I think your question really speaks to the issue of housing segregation, right? Mm -hmm. right. And um, that for many cities specifically, it's difficult to ensure that there is affordable living space. 
and then that will lead to um, having certain areas where they're over like over representation of poor people so I think it's much more a question of socioeconomic status actually and when you have poorer neighborhoods with people with lower incomes um, there is often a sort of like stigma that then develops around being from that place as a consequence is maybe rents are lower so it's kind of logical that people who don't have a lot of income have to move to these areas because they're crowded out of the housing market but, but it's also isn't there also a factor of uh, people liking to have a sense of familiarity or being able to be near people with the same background or is that the, le the least factor is mainly economic Sure, I mean, that is definitely something that you can see happening, that immigrant communities settle in certain areas. Um, it doesn't have to be a problem per se, right? It depends on what does the neighborhood look like, are there employment opportunities, are the schools good, um, is there a good mix of like private and social housing? Mm. I think that's the more difficult I question in terms of urban planning to ask yourself. Okay. But maybe also to add, w what I think is very important is, and there's a, an interesting int um, uh, difference between the United States, where we have a very low welfare state and where much is left to a private initiative. Mm. I mean, there's all kind of down, uh, let's say, negative aspects of that, but there's also one very positive, that there, let's say, refugees tend to be much less uh, institutionalized care. Yeah? Um, mm. um, and there are m many more room for civil society initiatives from the bottom up, um, where, let's say, this interaction between natives and refugees is, is, is much more uh, diverse than it tends to be in, well, let's say, high welfare states in Western Europe, where, for good reasons, let's say, uh, refugees are often very long kept apart in, into their own classes, own institutions, and it's much more top-down kind of policy. Mm. And I think and what we have seen happening in the last three to four years, and I think that's positive, is that there are many more bottom-up initiatives at the urban level especially. Okay. And mm. I think that's also yeah. something that mm. the central government should much more facilitate um, uh, in, in, in instead of, let's say, these top-down policies, which you also need, but not only. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Uh, I think it's time to move to the audience. Does, there, uh, does anyone have a question related to the topic? Can I have it? Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Faris. I'm uh, also a former refugee from Syria and originally from Palestine. I work as a project leader, uh, leader at a refugee company. Uh, I'm responsible for um, improving and creating integration programs for refugees. Uh, you have said a lot of interesting things that not a lot of people are aware of, uh, both actually Leo and uh, Eva, thank you. Um, uh, Eva, especially the thing that um, the people who are not really socially interactive with uh, immigrants, that they are really away from this uh, concept, that they know nothing about it, and they are really, there's a lot of fear mm. uh, about this. Um, and yeah, I always uh, say something that uh, integration is two-way uh, pledge. It's never yeah. one way that all the people who are coming here need to be integrated, but also the locals uh, also need to be integrated with the refugees. So uh, you you like you talk about it so briefly, but I would like to ask you, Leo, if you can a bit explain how do you see locals integrated with refugees? Thank you. Um, yeah, well, of course, if you have to realize that this partly is an asymmetrical relationship. Yeah, I mean, so this this means that let's say. Um, immigrants or refugees, and this is as a special type of immigrants, they have to put in more effort than those who are already there because they have to learn the language, they have to learn the institutions, uh, uh, they have to build networks, etc. So in that sense, more is, ex more is expected from them. But uh, as I said, if I look, I'm a historian, and I'm, I'm, I look at processes over longer periods, also intergenerational, yeah? Um, and then if you look at it as a process, something what, what that is happening, yeah? Um, you can, uh, it is very clear that, let's say, uh, whether societies like it or not, uh, or even uh, if they're totally against immigration, still they will change uh, under mm. the influence of, let's say, changing the demographics in where they live, in uh, the migrants bringing in uh, different issues and di different um, uh, elements into their life again, whether they like it or not. Uh, so also, we let's say native societies or settlement where people settle, they 
they change whether they like it or not. So and that's that's a and how they change. Yeah, that's something for empirical research. But it's it's often forgotten, as if let's say the receiving societies are a homogeneous block mm. yeah, culturally, uh, etc. And that okay, some people then join, and they so we have to to make them as soon as possible be like us. But that's not how it works. Yeah. But I'm not sure if that's a Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you really uh, match them together, you can get something mm. better out of it. So Ab you're absolutely right. And uh, so, and that's also what you see happening. So part of the population is quite positive. If you look at opinions uh, polls in the Netherlands, also for refugees, um, 60 to 70 percent are quite positive about it. I mean, and, and would like to do more for refugees. But that's not the impression that you get if you listen to the very polarized, let's say, societal debate. Now if you only look at, I'm on Twitter, for example, I mean, the kind of, the, the kind of rubbish that you get in, into your timeline if you say something very sensible and, and not polarized at all. But because it, it's, that if you don't say that all refugees are rapists, that, that already, let's say, is, is, is enough. But, but that's only, let's say, these are the fringes. I mean, the, the, there is a very large middle group mm -hmm. and, the, and the, the, the really the um, mm -hmm. um, majority of the population who is moderately positive in this sense. So, um, and who also realize that there is something to benefit from let's say, from diversity and without being naive and, 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 and let's say, uh, uh, op optimistic against all odds. I mean, and this is also something also that history teaches. I mean, Amsterdam in the 17th century, in the first half of the century, four out of ten people living in Amsterdam were from abroad. Now it's three. Yeah? I mean, and this was the golden age. Um, uh, well so... <laughs> well, there since you've spoken about the polarized rhetoric and, yeah, the kind of depictions that we see of refugee culture uh, as well, and some of, of it is not, like, not supported by facts, a lot mm -hmm. of it is just perception. So uh, I'd like to know that, firstly, there's, like, a legitimate threat of radicalization under these circumstances because you're pushing these communities into a corner with the kind of discourses that you have. How can these things be addressed in policy? Like, is it something that you can address in policy? like keep checking discourse so that it's not like affecting integration? Um, I mean, it's a free world. I mean, so politicians <laughs> can, within limits of the law, can say what they want. So y you cannot force pol politicians or pol political parties or journalists for that matter. Um, uh, the media also play a, a role in this, of course. Um, I mean, we, we cannot, and I, I don't think that would be a good idea to, mm. let's say, to, to mm. have a, to say you can't say this or you should say that. I mean. That, that would lead us in, in a kind of type of society I think most of us would not want. Um, the only thing, yeah, again, you can do is we as scholars is say how we think that mechanisms are, what the facts yeah. are, etc., and hope for, let's say, others to take it also more broadly and for politicians to be brave enough to take this stance. And I think, I mean, yeah. Angela Merkel has done this uh, much better, I would say, than our own prime minister. So there are mm. examples of how you, what is better and what is worse. Yeah. Wouldn't you say? And yeah, to add to this, I mean, besides this whole debate about like, what should public discourse look like? Is it informed by facts? Is it not? What are the media doing? What we haven't talked at all actually about is labor market discrimination or discrimination in general. Mm -hmm. And that is really something it doesn't have anything to do with radicalization, but that is something where governments do have a strong role to yeah. play to make sure that there is strong and effective legislation that combats discrimination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is generally kind of difficult to prove, but for the labor market, it's actually not that difficult. Yeah, because there's a lot of the research. The qualifications are discounted in the labor market, right? Yeah. That, like yes, but there you could always make the argument like, yeah, your qualifications are discounted because employers don't know how to interpret them. So it's not a discriminatory <laughs> attitude of not hiring you. They're just not sure about your skills. Mm -hmm. But what you see a lot, and more and more researchers have been doing that for pretty much every European country by now, is that they do these sort of CV testing studies so they have two CVs that are identical, but just the name is different. Mm -hmm. They send it out and then they see how much of response people get back to an identical CV. And you see very persistently throughout countries, throughout skill level, men, women, that if you have a name that is foreign sounding, mm -hmm. 
um, that your chances in the labor market are worse because you get less invitations to an interview. So there's very clear evidence there that labor market discrimination really is an issue and that is something where countries can do something about it and where you need to have strong anti-discrimination legislation and good recourse mechanisms that mm -hmm. people who have been victims or potential victims of that sort of discrimination actually can go somewhere. Yeah, so prob I'm not going to get a job here, I guess, then, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> in line with our conversation, yeah, it's it's a weird name for some reason. <laughs> yeah, uh, in line with the conversation we just had, uh, a question that we really like were pondering about is that then should integration policy be centered on an, uh, an attitude or centered around an attitude where you adopt a multicultural uh, attitude towards like policies or funding? or where you impose the burden of assimilation on refugee groups around this dominant culture which is now supporting them. Which is more fair, or what do you think should be our attitude towards that in this case? Well, uh, of course, this is a political question. This is not, mm -hmm. not something, I mean, academics might answer very differently yeah. to this, so this is a value issue. I would say as a citizen, I would choose for the first option, obviously, and you will not be surprised. Um, not only because I believe in, let's say, um, that let's say diversity uh, is good for societies in general, yeah, but also even if you don't believe that, and um, I think it's also economically the most sensible policy because this will cost you least money. I mean, even if you hate refugees, then still you should be interested in integrating them as soon as possible. At least they cost you less money. So um, as simple as that, mm. I would say. We have yeah. the same. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's more a moral philosophy question, right? About yeah. how you think society should be organized and what sort of liberties you should have as an individual, which is very far away from what I do on a daily yeah. basis in my work. But just with a very pragmatic approach, yeah. I mean, rather than having these sort of debates of like one dominant culture, assimilation, or multiculturalism, if you just look at what works, then you see, yes, you have to offer good educational opportunities to people mm. who come here, including also people who have lived there their entire lives, and make sure that they can participate in social, uh, political, and economic life. And I think that's a more fruitful discussion to be had, and unfortunately, actually, it doesn't happen that often yeah. then. And, and yeah. maybe also want to add one mm. thing to what Eva said. I think it also is the wrong, it, it conveys the wrong message. It really is empirically wrong mm. that immigrants or refugees have to be forced and if you don't force them they won't yeah mm -hmm. and this is simply not true as eva said in the beginning of, of of the interview i mean most of the refugees are very glad to be in societies like us because they were fleeing dictatorship and and, and oppression etc so also for empirically this is wrong as it is empirically wrong that we eh, the receiving society would all all have passed this cultural exam, mm. as if yeah. we don't discriminate yeah. anymore, women or homosexuals. I mean, look at the, the radical right, look at Twitter, at Facebook, how they talk about Jews, women, and these are the natives, yeah? yeah. So, I mean, so this is also a, a very yeah. false opposition. It's not fair to make this distinction. It's well, you can make a distinction, but then you have to be clear about it's that it's yeah. not we who are enlightened and yeah, they yeah. who still have that's to be I mean that's mm. not how it works N not, not how yeah. it is yeah, yeah. yeah. that's true that's yeah I think we're uh, heading towards the end of the interview um, uh, there's I think something we we want to end on and that is uh, what uh, what are some concrete things we as individuals can do as students to help uh, this integration process or help refugees to um, become better integrated within our societies you as an individual well, I mean, I think one part is just to sort of stand up what you believe in and when you have the feeling that discussions are going in the wrong way, be informed and know how to counter things that are simply not true. So trying to contribute to a debate that is a bit more fact-based, I think, is a very sort of hands-on thing you can do. And otherwise, I mean, there are so many civil society initiatives and so many great projects that are going on that I really do have a very tangible impact on people's lives. So that for sure is something where um, yeah. through volunteering and through becoming politically active, it makes um, a difference in other people's lives and just opening your own network to people who are new in the country, right? I think that's something, and again, I'm coming back a bit to like labor market integration mm -hmm. and jobs and finding jobs and knowing how to navigate the system. There's so much kind of 
tacit sort of implicit knowledge that takes a long while to get to figuring out how a place works. How do you apply for jobs? How pushy are you? Do you send another email? Are you expected to call them again if you don't hear an answer? Would that actually be very rude? These are things that are very country specific. And that is something that a lot of people who have grown up here or live there know. And others who have come here still need to learn. So in that sense also, you and your own networks that you have is something you can use to help others to get access to an internship, connect them to people who might be looking for someone to hire. There are many very practical things yeah. to do. Yeah, no, I have nothing to add. <laughs> to <laughs> because also, because we know how that one of the, s the, the greatest stumbling blocks at the beginning are the networks and not having mm. entrance to and just just imagine yourself going to Pakistan. Yes? So suppose we would be refugees in Pakistan. We don't know the language. We don't know how things work. I mean, so we would be very grateful for Pakistanis to be a buddy or to adopt us, to, to lead us into the society. So this is something very practical that we can all do. Yeah? Become uh, a volunteer at, um, um, let's say, uh, Vluchtelingenwerk Nederland or, or whatever. And, and, and as Eva said, there are many, many initiatives around so there's enough work to do i would say well, thank you so much for your time and for all that you have taught us today thank you to the audience for sparing the time and asking really good questions uh we wanted to do a shout out to this organization called refugees forward since we're speaking of civil society organizations you can look them up their representatives are here they help uh, refugees set up their own startups over there right over there Right, and you can mm -hmm. ask them about other organizations you can support. If you like this platform, if you want to look at our interviews, what we do, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, everything. And on Friday, we are having an interview on the future of the single currency. Please join us right here, 1 p.m. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. <laughs>